logically it makes sense. Take a ship up, it's one ship, but you wind up, uh, ships are very slow. They have to round uh, PEI and they have to round Nova Scotia. This way it's a direct route. Uh, the uh, the uh, going up the St. Lawrence can be congested, there can be ice, there can be issues like that. And uh, when you get to wherever you're going, if you go to the port of Montreal, you're dealing with huge port costs, you're dealing with high labor costs, you're dealing with things like that, that in a smaller port you're not dealing with. You know, you can you can bring your ship in and every, every hour or every day that those ships wait to be offloaded is huge money. I mean, they're, there's sixty, a hundred thousand dollars a day to rent a ship. So any any hour that you can save, you're saving a significant amount of money. So it, it actually did make economic sense for some cargoes anyway. We, you know, we we sent uh, lumber to Great Britain. We sent, you know, we we just shipped literally all over the world. But there were cargoes that made sense for that kind of operation. Mm -hmm. So I I, it, uh, I I think your point is well taken. I mean, it, it makes sense. But in fact, the economics of it are that it does make sense to do that. You know. And isn't there public transparency about this? I know at one point there was a, a scheme to build an airport right here, mm -hmm. and nobody bothered to tell the people in our town about it till they thought it was a done deal. But we mm -hmm. found out that they hadn't bothered to get the proper permits. And because we were able to call them on it, we were able to stop it. And I wonder if that sort of thing could happen in this case. But in the late 80s, um, there was a group of us here who thought of putting a big waste dump up in this area, and we won. So there's this underlying current in Washington County that's there that if you tap into it, it can surface its head again and, and assist you guys very much in this effort. Um, and the maps are wonderful, you know, and thank you. Um, I see three things your arguments are going to be based on. First is the economic aspect of it, and I'll say I live on Route 9 in Alexander, so I am very, very aware of the truck traffic <coughs> on that road, and there is not enough truck traffic on that road currently mm -hmm. to pay for that. The truck traffic averages, I would say, I've done counts, I walk the road a lot, get exercise, and I'd say the count averages probably are probably 35 to 25 to 30 an hour at the most, on a 24-hour period. So we're talking maybe 500 trucks a day. They're going to charge, I read, $200. You multiply that out, it's going to take you 25, 30 years to pay back $2 billion. No investor, when they can put their money in the stock market, double that or triple that by manipulating things, is going to put it into this. But I think an economic argument, you're really going to have to look at the truck traffic, and you probably are, but looking at what the cost-benefit ratio, how quickly the payback is, that's going to be a good argument against any Wall Street firm that wants to invest in this. Um, second, we've discussed, I'm calling it the three E's, the environmental impacts are going to be huge when you're crossing, the changing the route, and when you're crossing the Denny's, the East Machias, the Salmon Federation is trying to bring salmon back. I mean, that, they just got a whole bunch of new easements for that. And the last one is when you mentioned the easements. I went to, my eyes were open on that January 18th meeting. You know, we were going to Stud Mill Road. Fine, that's far away. That doesn't bother any of us down here. But when Daryl Brown started talking, he, shame on us. That's the part that got me. He, I hate it when somebody says shame on us because that's making us all feel guilty if you start objecting to it, you're stopping them. But easements are going to be a huge issue. When I mentioned that Route 1, when you're going closer to Route 1, I know a lot of the people who own land along near Route 1 in this area, and there's a lot, a lot of buying up of property and easements they're going to have to deal with. Lots of people. So how do you do it? You just take it by eminent domain. Daryl Brown is telling the truth, as far as I can discern, when he says, I'm not going to be taking this by easements. No, Chamro isn't, but they're going to have the courts come to you and say, by court order, you have to give your land up to this court. So they're not doing it. Be careful of language. That if this is, in fact, which I think it is, a utility quarter, quarter not a road, uh, that it would make more sense to go north yeah. uh, and connect with the already existing refinery in St. John and or something else in Halifax or uh, Canso. Uh, and I, I'm just wondering how this, if anyone knows what what the conversation was, in, <laughs> internal conversation was, uh, about the change in route and the change of focus from 
a pipeline to a road or vice versa? From at the beginning of it, the PWU was committed to not using eminent domain for their support. And by the end, he wasn't there for this particular one. It was Daryl Brown. And by the end of it, well, we won't use it if, if we don't have to. <laughs> it is that That's amount of time. Intended. You know, the, the double speak was happening. And um, yeah, it just, it just made, you know, just nothing that they said um, held any kind of water except for advertising. Hmm. Because they think it's going to bring in a lot of tax revenue for the town. What do you say to people like that? So if the town of Byron can almost pass an ordinance saying that everybody in the town has to have a firearm in their house, certainly some of these key municipalities or townships, I mean, it'd have to be municipalities, have local to ability to create a local ordinance. Couldn't they just pass a local ordinance saying that no east-west corridor shall pass through this town? I just have a few insights on the northern route that has now been, they've kind of turned away from that. But uh, as we already mentioned, the Musong Refuge is 66 feet wide in the Magarawak area, and it's marshland on both sides. So that seems like that would be a barrier anyway if they were to use the new existing state-of-the-art border crossing in Cal's. If they were to build a new border crossing north of Cal's, it would line them up with the Studnell Road, and that does look like it would make a lot of sense, a straight line. But it would pass through the Down East Lakes Land Trust Sunrise Conservation Easement. And this conservation easement is made up of 312,000 acres that used to belong to Georgia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And it was sold and bought up by Typhoon LLC, which I understand is an investment group in Boston. It's managed by Wagner Timberland. The, a group in Grand Lake Stream about 2004 got together talking about uh, land around that area because they were concerned about people buying it up and shutting it off and the guiding and, uh, and sporting camp businesses would go belly up if that happened. Well, they got together with Wagner and they decided that they could actually buy the development rights for that 312,000 acres which surrounds Grand Lake Stream area. It actually goes from about Chain Lake all the way up to Vanceboro. So they put on a program to raise money. It was $12 million was the price tag. What they're doing is buying the, cons the development rights for that 312,000 acres to make this sunrise conservation easement. That money was secured. And the deed or the easement is held by the New England Forestry Foundation out of Littleton, Massachusetts. And I've spoke to them. And they have said, if they try to cross that road, they'll have to do it by eminent domain because that, that would be considered development to put a four-lane highway across. Now, the Stud Mill Road does have that corridor, or that, but that is a public access corridor, not a gated access private. I mean, that is, that's, the mentality of that is to be open to public uh, uh, access and not to be shut off by a private road. So it does not meet any criteria that that easement has, which would be in the Registry of Deeds right here in Machias, it's about 34 pages long, which is bought and paid for. The town of Grand Lake Stream raised $40,000 out of town revenue to go towards it. My wife and I contributed to it. Some very rich people contributed to it, and, uh, and in the amount of time they needed, they got together the $12 million and was bought and paid for. So it isn't just like a little park that they'd go through and it would be too bad to build a road through. That is, it's really a bought and paid for uh, easement to protect development rights for that whole 312,000 acres, which uh, historically uh, was actually Georgia Pacific land that went with their mill in Baileyville. Mm -hmm. Before they sold it to Domtown, they just sold their property. They allowed leaseholders to buy their leases and sold everything to Typhoon LLC, and you'll see corner posts in certain areas around there that says Typhoon, and, uh, and uh, it's an investment group. Thank you. So it is a big barrier to them, and that's why they 
all of a sudden mm -hmm. said we gotta we gotta head south and well by the way now we can say we're gonna go east near Eastport and what a wonderful thing that would be, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like an afterthought. Yeah, I had a question about um, the rail line. Uh, other than change uh, problems with border crossings and border security, what needs to be done to present the existing rail line as a viable option to this corridor? The biggest danger of a project like this is it's it's so large, if it gets a lot of investment and powers behind it, inevitably the people will pay for it in, in spades. You know? It won't be allowed to fail, mm -hmm. and it will be publicly subsidized in many ways, and it will continue just to extract and any resources it can. I, I feel like it's, it's more than a Trojan horse. It's kind of one of these things like so many of these super projects that are even you banks. Know, they get to a size where there's so many people holding stakes in it who are powerful. Mm -hmm. That it will happen. It will take your house, you know, that it, it's very hard to stop that stuff. So, this is a really good place to be organizing now before it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it probably has a lot of these folks already there, so it, it's a tender place to be. In the, in the coming weeks, you're going to be coming back to the Machias Rotary Club to speak to the, to the club there, and that's public, and it's at the Bluebird Ranch on Tuesday. I do you remember which I'll look. date, right. Right. but it's also in the paper. Um, and the, the Rotary uh, set, because they wanted to have a balanced uh, discussion about it, a few weeks later, someone, I think from Chinbro, is going to come and speak to the club. And so if you'd like to be there for that, too, that would be awesome. Um, and the other thing is that um, what Chris just mentioned about uh, people having conversations about big, brilliant alternatives to this. Um, I'm super into being part of a study group about that and like helping um, take leadership in those sorts of things in the community. And so if people are uh, interested in talking about that stuff, please please contact me. My name is Kevin. I work with the BI Collective. Exactly. And, and my mind keeps going to the groups that it's going to affect in the study room, what mm -hmm. it's going to do to the logging industry. Mm -hmm. To have a major super highway running down the study room road and you have trucks trying to access going north to get to the mills to the north and going south, they're going to build an overpass in every little side road that those truckers use to get to Route 9 or to get to Route 6. Mm -hmm. I don't think they will. So those guys are going to have to drive miles and miles out of their way mm -hmm. to get to where they want to go just to get around this thing. Yeah, please use your connections. Um, to bring us around, bring yourselves around once you're educated about it as much as you can. Yes, sir. Uh, I was at a uh, forestry forum in Brewer where the, the group, pretty much statewide, of forestry people met and uh, Mr. Vigu put on a presentation. The group there seemed more positive to the East West Highway than the, than the general public, and basically because they saw it as a way to move wood products. And so I think it's a, uh, I have the same issue. I don't think we're going to have an overpass at every logging trail that crosses uh, mm -hmm. the Staten Hill Road west of uh, Machias River. So I think it's going to be an impediment to, to logging. But as far as the wood products people, they see this as another way they can hop on and get their products uh, one way or the other. And. Uh, as far as talking to state legislators, I think it's real important. I live in the Princeton area. My legislator also represents the Lincoln area. And so when I spoke to her about my concerns about the East-West side, which is, well, I understand. But you also have to understand I represent the people in Lincoln. And they're telling me that Lincoln Tissue's uh, main purchases are in Wisconsin. So if they can hop on the interstate, drive down to an interchange, and get on the East-West Highway, it's going to aim them right to Wisconsin and therefore they, are gonna, they had to write down how many dollars and cents they will save per truck lo truckload of their product that is produced in Lincoln, Maine by Lincoln people who benefit from that economic you know, uh, business. So it is important to talk to your legislators because they're going to be hearing it from the product producers, the mills, and the people who work at mills that think that their income will increase because of better transportation in the state.